You know, I believe that all of us are born with an inner sense of fairness. We want things to be fair, don't we? And it doesn't take long for those of us as parents when our children come along, especially if there's more than one, before we will hear the words, that's not fair. They recognize what's fair and what's not fair, and they want what is fair to be played out in their lives. You know, our, our natural tendency is even to fight back in a moment when we feel that we are being treated unfair. So having said all that, my question is this for you this morning. How do you respond when you are unfairly treated by an employer, a boss, a supervisor? How do you respond? You feel that, that, I cannot believe they did that. I can't believe they asked that of me. I can't believe. Do you, do you complain? Do you get angry? Do you blow up? Are you an individual that perhaps you vow to get even? I'm going to make them regret ever doing that. Do you slam things down and walk out the door and say, I'm done. You can have this job. In our text this morning, Peter addresses that. He addresses how we respond to those above us in authority in the workplace who treat us in an unfair way, who are harsh, unreasonable. Now he uses, and if you were listening this morning, he uses the word slave or servant. And, and this is the group that he's addressing. But the word that he uses is not the word for, that's typically used in the New Testament for slave, which is doulos. It's a different word. It is a word that in that day and time would have meant more of a household servant. And, and if you go back and you look at how things were in the Roman Empire during Peter's day, it's estimated there were some 60 million let me say that again, 60 million slaves in the Roman Empire. There were more slaves in the Roman Empire than there were citizens in the Roman Empire. But slavery in that day and time was different from what many of us remember from history here in our country prior to the Civil War. I say that because what we find in our study of the history of Rome and their slavery is that many of the slaves held positions of responsibility. You see, their slaves were doctors, and they were teachers, and they were musicians, and they were actors, and they were secretaries. And the interesting thing about slavery in Rome and in the Roman Empire is that they were paid. They were normally paid for their services, and they could expect to save up their money and eventually buy themselves out of their slavery. But even though that was true, there were times that the person who was over them could be unreasonable and harsh. And so, as we look at our text this morning, I want you to think more in the lines of employer-employee, supervisor-worker, however you want to phrase it in that way, because it applies if we, if we try to make an application to it in our lives today. That's really where he's addressing our, his remarks. And what I want us to do is look and see what Peter says to us about how we should respond to those above us who may be dishonest and unscrupulous. Now, I'm going to begin by telling you, you're not going to like what he has to say. Because he calls on us to do some things that are out of our norm, maybe even out of our comfort zone. But if you look at the very beginning of our text again, he talks about, he begins by saying, Servants, be submissive to your masters with all respect, not only to those who are good and gentle, but also to those who are unreasonable. He says not only are we to submit to those employers or supervisors who are good and gentle, but he says, I want you to also do that to the ones who are unreasonable. That's the way the New American Standard translates it. And it's easy, isn't it? When we have a, an employer or a supervisor above us that's good, that's gentle, that's easy to work for, oh, that makes life that much better. We love going to work. We love doing our job. But what about 
those times when we have somebody that is far different from that, it's difficult, isn't it, when they're unreasonable. And the word he uses, the word he uses that's translated by the New American Standard as unreasonable is a word that literally means crooked. It's the, it's the Greek word scolios. You ever heard of scoliosis? That lateral curvature of the spine? It's the same, that's where it comes from. It's from that Greek term. And so what it indicates when it's referring to the character of an individual is someone who is unjust, someone who is harsh, someone who is cruel. One translation even uses the word someone who is perverse. And we find ourselves working under that individual. And what Peter is doing, he's making a contrast. And, 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 and two kinds of masters, two kinds of employers, two kinds of supervisors. One is good and gentle. The other is crooked. They're, they're perverse. And he tells us that not only are we to submit to these individuals, he says that we're to do it with, here's where it really gets hard, all respect. Show respect toward that individual. You can't, I can't, I can't believe you're asking me to do that. It's not me, it's God, through his apostle Peter. Yes, show respect to that individual, even though that individual is unfair, even though that individual is crooked, even though that individual is perverse, even though it's somebody that, you, if I had another job, I'd walk out the door today. He says, show respect. And the question that you, I know is in your minds is this, how do I possibly do that? What makes it possible for me to bear up under that kind of unjust suffering? And here's what Peter says. He says, for this finds favor with God, if for the sake of conscience, conscience toward God, a person bears up under sorrows when suffering unjustly. I put up here the English Standard Version translation of that because it's really closer, I think, to what he's saying. Look at what he says. This is a gracious thing. Literally, it says this is grace. In the original, this is grace. It's a gracious thing. When mindful of God, one endures while suffering unjustly. What makes it possible for us to endure this unjust suffering? It is because while we're going through it as Christians, while we're in the midst of that, what Peter is saying is be aware, be consciously aware that God is present in the moment. God is there in that situation, in that moment, watching how you're responding. And that's what it means for us to be mindful of God. Let me share with you a couple of other passages from the Apostle Paul. One's found in Ephesians in chapter 6, the other's in Colossians chapter 3. In Ephesians chapter 6, there in verse 7, beginning in verse 7, he says, With good real will, render service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good thing each one does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether slave or free. He said, do it with good will. Why? Because you realize that the service I'm rendering is not really to this individual who's mistreating me. He's being unfair. I'm really working for the Lord. And I'm going to do the best job I can at what I'm doing because I'm really serving him. Paul says almost the same thing in his letter to the church at Colossae. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 23, he says, Whatever you do, do your work heartily as to the Lord rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. Remember about that inheritance that Peter talks about that's reserved in heaven for us? He says, you know you're going to receive that inheritance, but do your work heartily. You, you're not working for that individual. You're really working for God. And he says, work as if that's who you're working for. This person is just someone that you, you must show respect to and do it in a way that honors God, but ultimately you're working for God. You see, here's, here's the way all of this works out. That respectful submission that we render to that individual and to the undeserved suffering that we're going through, Peter says it finds favor. Literally, grace. 
It finds grace with God. Why? Because it demonstrates, it is a behavior that demonstrates His grace. What is he saying? What Peter is saying, to put it another way, is this, we find grace with God. We find favor with God when we are taking the time to show grace to the individual that is not treating us as they should. We're showing them grace, and because we're showing them grace, God is showing us grace. Another way, we're treating them the same way we want them to treat us. You ever heard that before? Matthew 7, verse 12. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Not as they do unto you, but as you would have them do unto you. Or as the New American Standard, treat others in the way you want them to treat you. You see, that's what it's all about. They may not treat us well, but we're still going to treat them well. And, and we receive grace from God because we're extending grace to this individual. And when we respond in this way, what we're really doing, folks, we're imitating our Father. Back in Luke chapter 6, there in verse 35, one of the things that Jesus said about his Father is he is kind to the ungrateful and evil. Those people who are ungrateful, those people who are evil, God is still kind. But there's another reason that he tells us that we can respond in such a way. And it's something that he said just a few verses back before this. It's back in verse 15. Because he says there that such is the will of God that by doing good or doing what is right, you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. Here's, the, here's what Peter is telling us. It's that when you and I keep doing good, even in the midst of a difficult circumstance, even in the midst of somebody that's not responding in kind to us, he says you're acting totally different from the world. How do people in the world typically respond and react when they are mistreated to those who have authority over them and are unjust toward them? Do they complain? Yes. Do some of them retaliate? Yes. Do maybe some of them bring lawsuits? Probably. Do some of them steal? Well, they, they're, they're not giving me what I really am worth, so I'm going to take a few things here and there and just slip it on out the door because I deserve it. Yes. And other things like that. And yet what Peter says is that when you and I do good, when we don't retaliate, when we don't do all these things, when we do good, what we really do is we silence those who might have anything bad to say about us because what we are doing is you and I are ultimately bringing glory to God through, first of all, the way we are responding to the situation. We will ultimately bring them to glorify God, if not in this life, in the life to come. But that's what it's all about, bringing glory to Him. And yet, as he says all of this, there is an exception to this that we must all make sure we pay attention. I call it an exception. Maybe that's not the right way to describe it. And it's this. He says, if you're suffering, if you're experiencing the suffering, he says, make sure that you're experiencing suffering because you're doing good and not because you're doing something that is wrong, not because you're doing evil. The way he puts it there in verse 20, he says, For what credit is there if when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it with patience? I mean, if you're mistreated because you're doing wrong, because you're not doing what you should do, he says none of us should expect praise from God for doing that. We're being treated according to what we deserve. We, we've responded in a bad way. We're not doing what's right. And if we endure harsh treatment as a result of our wrongdoing, then he says, that's what's due you. How many of us have known someone who did wrong and was perhaps even punished for it, but who kept saying, I was mistreated. I was mistreated. You ever been called to the school, maybe by the principal because your child did something in the school and it was wrong. But then you didn't agree with the principal. Oh, my child doesn't do anything wrong. My child's good. And that's not, maybe not the case, is it? Those who have been in the educational system know there are times when that child 
has done wrong, and even though mom and dad don't believe it, they saw it with their own eyes. You remember the two thieves on the cross? The cross is, I should say, Jesus was crucified between two thieves. It's interesting, their responses to what's going on. The first one that Luke tells us about there in his gospel, there in chapter 23, verse 39, the first one is insulting Jesus. He's hurling abuse at him. As a matter of fact, he says, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. Get us out of this mess. What's the second one do? The second one rebukes the first one. And what he says to him is, we indeed are suffering justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds. We're being punished for what we did. We did the things that they have accused us of. We're guilty. We deserve this punishment. But this man, Speaking of Jesus, this man has done nothing wrong. He doesn't deserve this suffering. And we know that, don't we? Peter says that if you and I patiently endure this kind of suffering, he said it needs to be for doing what's right. That we're doing what's right. And if we're punished for doing what's right, so be it. But such a response will come as a surprise to that person who would expect us to maybe want to retaliate, get it even, or to, to shout, it, shout at them or something of that nature. Ultimately, what Peter says is that you and I need to look to Jesus Christ as our supreme example of this kind of behavior. And he, he describes in the last few verses of our text this morning just exactly how Jesus did that. And he tells us that we are, we're called for a purpose, and that purpose is to emulate Christ. The way he puts it here in verse 21 is, You have been called for this purpose since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. If you're a Christian here this morning, God has called you to patiently suffer and endure that suffering, that unjust suffering, because it will bring not only spiritual maturity into your life, it will also find favor with God. And that runs contrary to the mindset that our society often has that asks, what's in it for me? What am I going to get out of this? How am I going to benefit from this? It also runs afoul of the, the, the idea of a health, wealth, prosperity gospel that teaches that once we become Christians, all of life is roses and we're not supposed to have any problems and that everything is taken care of. And yet we don't find that to be true when we look at the lives of the apostles or the lives of Christians in the early church. You see, like the Lord we will experience tribulation in this world because of our decision to follow Christ. In Romans chapter 5, there in verses 3 and 4, Paul says that we exult, we rejoice in tribulation, in suffering. And he tells us why. Knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, and perseverance, proven character, and proven character, hope. You see, if we, if we persevere, if we endure that tribulation, that unjust suffering, he says ultimately what that's going to do in your life is it's going to, that tribulation is going to bring about the ability to persevere in such situations. And your ability to persevere is going to work on developing your character so that you become a person that is more Christ-like. And then ultimately, it's going to strengthen your hope of what is yet to come of a God who will see you through. Paul put it another way in a letter that he wrote to the church at Philippi, Philippians chapter 1, verse 29, where he said this. He says, To you it has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in Him, but also to suffer for His sake. He said this is what we should expect. We shouldn't expect a life that has no problems, no suffering, no difficulties in it. That's part of what we should expect. And Christ's obedience to his Father throughout all of this unjust suffering, Peter says, has left us an example of the kind of life that's pleasing to God. It's what we long for. So what does that life look like? How does he describe it? He tells us some things about Jesus. He says that he committed no sin. 
And as he's saying all this, he's going back to Isaiah chapter 53, something that a prophet by the name of Isaiah had written some 700 years earlier, speaking specifically about Jesus. But when you look at different things that New Testament writers said about Jesus, Paul said that he knew no sin. The Hebrew writer in chapter 4, verse 15 of the book of Hebrews says that he was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. If you look at what John says over in 1 John chapter 3, verse 5, he plainly says, in him there was no sin. This was Jesus. He committed no sin. And God's desire for us is that you and I might live a perfectly sinless life, even when we are faced with the most difficult circumstances. Will we be successful in this? No. Why? Because we're constantly struggling in our lives to be what God calls us to be. But it doesn't mean we stop trying. It doesn't mean we try to live a life in which we respond in the way we should and that we try to be sinless. And even though we find ourselves suffering at the hands of an unjust employer, we need to be able to recognize, maybe I should say that employer needs to be able to recognize that we always strive to do what's right. You know, they pick up, don't they? They pick up on what you do and how you respond and things that you consider important. And if you're living for Christ, if that employer, even though they treat you unjustly, they watch you to see how you respond. If they see, this person always tries to do the right thing. No matter what I do, they're always trying to do the right thing. We're trying to be like our Savior who committed no sin nor, as he says, was any deceit found in his mouth. In other words, Jesus always said what was true. He said what was right. As a matter of fact, in the beginning of his gospel, John the apostle says that in him he was full of grace and truth. And it was Jesus, if you remember at the Last Supper, who said to his disciples that he was the way, the truth, and the life. If we're to emulate Jesus... Folks, we need to be people who are known for speaking the truth. Not just the truth about God's Word, but just truth in general. Nobody could ever accuse us of telling a lie. No one could ever accuse us of fabricating something because they know, no, that person, they're going to they're tell the truth regardless of what it may cost them. They're going to speak the truth. And Paul even said that we should lay aside all falsehood and speak truth with as he says each of you with your neighbor so not only should we be known for speaking truth but we need to speak that truth in love the third thing he tells us about Jesus is that he did not retaliate he says while being reviled he did not revile in return there in verse 23 and that while suffering he uttered no threats as I said while Peter was writing these words his mind no no doubt went back 700 years to what Isaiah had written. And, and specifically there in Isaiah 53 is it's verse 7 in our text, our Bibles. And what he says there about Jesus, what the prophet says, is he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that is silent before his shearers, so he did not open his mouth. He did not revile. He did not curse them while they were saying the things about him that they were, while they were driving the, the nails through his hands and feet. He didn't do that. He did not revile. And Peter describes in the next chapter for us, chapter 3 of this letter that we're looking at, there in verses 8 and 9, a life that avoids this retaliation. Here's the way he puts it. He says, to sum up, all of you be harmonious. What does it mean to be harmonious? It means we work to get along. Sympathetic. What's it mean to be sympathetic? We care about people around us. We care about their plight, their situation. Brotherly. Remember something that Peter said we looked at a couple of weeks ago? Let brotherly love continue. Kind-hearted. Are you a person who's kind of heart? Do you truly try to do good to people around you? Humble in spirit. And then he says, not returning evil for evil, insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead, for you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. If people mistreat you, you do good 
Even though they mistreat you, you do good to them. Why? You give them a blessing in their life. Ultimately, you will receive a blessing. Maybe not, probably not back from them. Maybe so, but ultimately from God. You see, not only are you and I to avoid getting even or insulting one, another person, that person who has mistreated us, but we're trying to bless their lives and to do good. And the result, God's blessing in our own lives. But then he says this, he entrusted himself to God. Jesus did. Entrusted himself to him who judges righteously. Jesus, the fact that Jesus entrusted himself to his Father's care is an attitude that we see throughout the Gospels. As a matter of fact, there's two places that it comes across very prominently. One is in the garden, the other is on the cross. In the garden, you may remember that Jesus prayed three times, and, 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 and Luke records him as praying, and we know it in the other Gospels as well. Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me, yet not my will but yours be done. How could he submit to the Father's will? Because he knew ultimately the Father had his care at heart. Yes, he was going to save the world through him, but this was his son. And Jesus entrusted himself to his father, knowing that his father would see him through all of this. And then on the cross, what does he pray? Loud voice. Last thing he says, Father, in your hands I commit my spirit. It is finished. I entrust myself to you because I know you're going to take care of me. How many of us do that? How many of us can pray a prayer in which we say, Father, I entrust myself to you today. I don't know what I'm going to encounter. I don't know how I'm going to be treated by this employer or this supervisor or whoever it may be, but I'm trusting in you to see me through and to help me deal with it in the way that I should, to respond in a way that honors you, to show respect as I should, to give a blessing even though I'm not being blessed by it, but let me do these things that you want me to do and you see to my well-being. You know, on the cross, as Peter brings it out, Jesus himself bore our sins in his body. Why? So that you and I can die to sin and live in it no longer. So we can put it behind us and, and, and say, God has separated that from me as far as the east is from the west. Now I can live for righteousness. I can do the things that are right in God's sight. And through his own words or, or wounds, he goes on, Peter tells us that what Jesus does is he heals us. Listen to how Isaiah described it. There in Isaiah 53, verse 5, He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. You know, there was a time when you and I were continually straying like sheep, wandering about in life. But as Peter puts it, we have returned and Jesus' sacrifice made our return possible that we could return to the shepherd and the guardian of our souls. I want you to remember this. As a Christian, the world may never appreciate or applaud your faithfulness to Christ. Don't expect it to do so. It may never happen. And unless we understand that it is God's praise that we seek and not the praise of our fellow man, we will find ourselves becoming discouraged in situations as Peter's describing and probably turning away from God's will altogether. So just understand in your life, this may be, this may be something, I, my cross, that I will carry for as long as I'm at this place of employment but I want to carry it in such a way that I honor God in the process. But remember this, you and I as Christians belong to Christ. Our citizenship is in heaven and we're eagerly awaiting his return. And when we are called by him to make sacrifices, when we're called by him to endure hardships, it's the knowledge that we are his special people and that there is an inheritance that he has reserved in heaven for us that gives us something to keep striving for in a direction in which we keep moving. If you're a Christian today, please don't forget those things. But if you're here today and you're not a Christian, 
I want you to know that our God has made possible your salvation, the forgiveness of your sins, to draw you back to himself. And you will not find a life that will be as fulfilling as the life that you can find in Christ. It's just not there. I heard something in a podcast I was listening to yesterday on my way back from the funeral in Nashville, and it was a statement, and, and I want to go back and chase it down, but it said 60% of our teenage girls today in this nation are struggling. They're struggling, trying to find answers. Moms, dads, grandparents, you've got them. Point them to Christ. Help them to see that this world does not have the answers. The answers are found only in one place. And it's in our Lord. If you need to respond to him this day, if you want your sins washed away, if you want to come to God and become his child, that is the way we do it. Be willing to confess him. Turn from your sin. Be buried with him in baptism. If we can assist you in that today, won't you come right now as together we stand and sing.